Welcome to the Bar Exam Toolbox podcast. Today we're talking about subject matter jurisdiction as part of our Listen and Learn series. Your Bar Exam Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess, that's me. We're here to demystify the bar exam experience so you can study effectively, stay sane, and hopefully pass and move on with your life. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website Career Dicta. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on your favorite listening app and check out our sister podcast, the Law School Toolbox Podcast. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact form on barexamtoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. Hi, and welcome back to the Listen and Learn series from the Bar Exam Toolbox podcast. Today we are tackling another subject you'll remember from your CivPro class in law school, and one you'll definitely see somewhere on the bar exam, Subject Matter Jurisdiction, or SMJ. You probably already understand the basic concept of jurisdiction. It has to do with whether the right people and topics are in the right court. As you know, when a lawsuit starts out, the plaintiff files in one court, but the defendant can sometimes try to get the case into a different court instead, one where the laws may be more favorable. For federal subject matter jurisdiction, the question is whether a federal court is the right place to adjudicate the claims. There are two types of actions that federal courts have jurisdiction over. Those are one, federal questions, and two, diversity actions. If you haven't already made your attack plans for CivPro, be sure to map out SMJ because it has quite a few moving parts, and on essays, it has a set structure that the graders want to see. Your main header, obviously, is subject matter jurisdiction, and you'll need a general rule about what SMJ is. Underneath that, you should have two subheaders, one for federal question and another for diversity, and below each of these, you should put a short rule. The rule for federal questions is pretty straightforward. The complaint filed by the plaintiff needs to show a right or interest founded substantially on federal law. Basically, the question here is whether the plaintiff is bringing an action for something federal. If so, his case belongs in federal court. The analysis here should be about whether the facts you are given about a plaintiff's complaint are substantially based on federal law or not. In order to determine this, you will need to know what kinds of things typically fall under federal law. The exam writers may even make up a new statute, so you have to guess. But this doesn't happen all that often. The important thing is that you can argue the facts you are given and explain your reasoning. On the other hand, the rule for diversity actions, our other way of getting into federal court, is a little more detailed. This is the one that is commonly tested on bar essays. Under diversity, there are two subprongs. First, there needs to be what is called complete diversity, and second, there needs to be the right amount in controversy. These break down even further. Complete diversity of citizenship means that no plaintiff is a citizen of the same state as any defendant. Okay, now what does that mean? Well, if you imagine a lawsuit with all the parties written out with a V between their names, like Joe and Jeff versus Carol and Howard, complete diversity is only going to get checked off if no one on Joe's side is from the same state as anyone on the Carol side. And citizenship here means domicile. You'll remember domicile means physical presence in a state with the intent to remain there permanently. Basically, the place you call home. For example, maybe you're in law school in New York, but your mail gets sent to your family's home in California, and you want to go back and practice there after graduation. That means that California is your domicile. That's how to determine citizenship for people, but what about corporations? Often the defendant is a company and not an individual. In that situation, you need to look at a couple of things. First, the state of incorporation, and second, the principal place of business. Incorporation is sort of like where the company was founded, and it's either going to be given to you in the facts or not. The facts may say something like, Zoo Company and Oklahoma Corporation, or even Zoo Company was incorporated in Oklahoma. You may also see phrases like, Principal Place of Business, or Headquarters. These tell you about where the corporation is making crucial decisions and taking action. You may not even be given any of these labels and just see a bunch of facts about different activities going on in various places. Remember, you're looking for where the corporation is at home, so search for facts about where the directors and officers make decisions, 
where the products are made, and where business operations take place. I think the very easiest way to set up your analysis on an essay is to draw a quick column on your scratch paper plan for each state that is mentioned in the fact pattern. Then, if the facts say something happened in a state, you just jot it down in the appropriate column. Kathy lived in California? Good. Write her name under California. The defective coffee cup was manufactured in Illinois? Write that down. You get the idea. Okay, so far we've been talking about a diversity requirement. There is also the amount in controversy requirement. When you're making your attack plan, imagine stair steps going down. Amount in controversy is on the same level as complete diversity. Both of these subheaders go under the umbrella of diversity jurisdiction. The rule for amount in controversy is that there needs to be a good faith allegation of damages exceeding $75,000, excluding interest and attorney's fees. So what does that mean? Well, basically, the plaintiff has to come to court with a problem she is asking to be fixed, and that problem has to be bigger than $75,000 worth of damage. Normally, you will get dollar amounts in the fact pattern. But if you don't, you may have to state your rule and then use the facts to guess about whether the claim is serious enough to meet the threshold amount. For example, if the facts don't give you any numbers, but you're told that Kathy's burns were severe and she required multiple surgeries, you can explain why you think Kathy would allege that this problem probably cost more than $75,000 to fix. You may also see a fact pattern where there are various dollar amounts at play. Maybe the plaintiff sued for several things, like a personal injury and a breach of contract. Whether or not you can add these amounts in controversy together to get over the more than $75,000 hurdle depends on whether you can aggregate claims. The rule is that claim aggregation is allowed if you have one plaintiff against one defendant or if the defendants are jointly and separately liable. Makes sense, right? So if Carol sues Joe for a bunch of stuff, she can add it all together. But if Carol sues Joe and Jeff, she can't just mix everything together because that would make it harder to parse out which defendant is on the hook. We won't get too far into aggregation today, but it is a common topic on the bar, so you should definitely review this one on your own. Okay, so these are the basic rules we need for subject matter jurisdiction. Let's get into some hypos to test them out. This first one is from the Civil Procedure Essay on the California Bar Exam in July 2012. Ready? Here we go. Pam and Patrick are residents of State A. While visiting State B, they were hit by a truck owned and operated by Corporation, a freight business. Corporation is incorporated under the laws of Canada and has its headquarters there, where its president and secretary are located. State B is the only state in which Corporation conducts its business. Corporation's drivers and other employees work out of its warehouse in State B. Pam and Patrick jointly filed a lawsuit against Corporation and Federal District Court in State A. In their complaint, Pam demanded damages for personal injury in the amount of $70,000 and for property damage in the amount of $10,000. Patrick demanded damages in the amount of $6,000. Does the Federal Court in State A have subject matter jurisdiction over the case? Well, first things first. Which basis for federal subject matter jurisdiction are we going for here? Is there a federal question involved? No, this was a car accident, which means it falls under tort law, and that's state law, not federal. That means that we need to look for the other kind of federal subject matter jurisdiction, diversity. Do we have complete diversity of citizenship? Well, Pam and Patrick are both residents of state A. Notice it says residents and not citizens or domiciled in. This is a small hole in the facts. You should point out very quickly that since the test requires domicile, or in other words, residence plus the intent to remain, and there are no facts about Pam's or Patrick's intent to remain in state A, this could open up some ambiguity. So don't spend more than one sentence on this. Just say something like, there is no evidence that Pam or Patrick does not have the intent to remain. Thus, their residence in state A could probably also be considered domicile. Okay, so both of our plaintiffs are citizens of the same state. Is that a problem for diversity? You might be tempted to say yes, but remember, the rule is that people on either side of the V need to be from different places. All the plaintiffs can be from the same state as each other, and that's not a problem. But what about the defendant? On your scratch paper, you could put a column for State A, State B, and Canada, since those are all the places mentioned in the facts. So we know Corporation is incorporated in Canada. 
It also has its headquarters in Canada. And the facts say that the president and the secretary are in Canada as well. There's also some stuff going on in State B, like the warehouse and doing business and the drivers and employees. So what do you think? Is Canada or State B the place of citizenship for corporation? There are enough facts that you could argue for both, but your conclusion should be Canada. Why? Because the decision-making power and the actual running of the business happened there. Remember, though, the graders want to see your thought process and your analysis. So use all the facts and explain your way to the conclusion. Say what is happening in State B and then say why it is not enough to meet the test for citizenship. Is complete diversity checked off? Well, we have two plaintiffs from State A and a defendant from Canada. So the answer is yes. No plaintiff is a citizen of the same place as the defendant. Now, the next step in the analysis is, is the amount in controversy met? Pam is alleging $70,000 in personal injuries and $10,000 in property damage. The threshold amount we need to get to is more than $75,000. Think of this as $75,000 plus one cent. So neither amount on its own meets the requirement. So can we add them together or aggregate? Yes, because they are claims by one person against one defendant. So since $70,000 plus $10,000 equals $80,000, and $80,000 is more than our required $75,000, Pam meets the amount and controversy requirement. I know this sounds overly simplistic to spell out such simple math, but that's exactly what you should do on the bar. Show your whole thought process and go step by step. But what about poor Patrick? He demanded damages in the amount of $6,000. That's not more than $75,000. Can he add his amount and controversy together with Pam? No, because that would be two plaintiffs against one defendant, and that breaks our rule. Now, there is another CIFPRO topic called supplemental jurisdiction. The rule there is basically that different claims can be tacked together when they are about the same stuff. The wording you want to remember is common nucleus of operative fact. If the two claims arise out of a common nucleus of operative fact, then they can be brought together. We don't have enough time to cover this topic today. But you should look into this on your own because it's commonly tested on the bar. There's not that much law to remember, but it can change the outcome of your analysis significantly. Suffice to say, since the same car accident involved the same location and the same people and the same event, and we're not worried about adding claims that could defeat diversity, we can say this meets the test. So Pam and Patrick could tack their claims together. The court could get subject matter jurisdiction over the case. Is everything making sense so far? Let's try another example to be sure. This one is pulled from the California Bar Exam CivPro essay from February 2009, but we've edited this a bit to highlight the subject matter jurisdiction issue. CopyCo Inc., a maker of copy machines, was incorporated in State A. Its main corporate office and president are also located in State A. Most of CopyCo's employees work in State B at its sole manufacturing plant. CopyCo also has a distribution center in State B. Sally is a citizen of State B. Sally was using a CopyCo copy machine at Blinko, a copy center within State B, when the machine started to jam, severely injuring her hand. Sally filed a lawsuit against CopyCo as the sole defendant in the State B Northern District Federal Court. Her complaint alleges that CopyCo was negligent and that she has suffered physical injury, and also seeks damages of $100,000 exclusive of costs and interest. Does the federal court have subject matter jurisdiction over Sally's claim? First step, is there a federal question? No, why not? Because Sally sued for negligence and torts law is state law, not federal. Look out for clues like this on the real bar exam. It might seem like background information telling you what the lawsuit was about, but it can check off this rule element by telling you no federal questions were involved. Next, can we get into federal court based on diversity jurisdiction? Well, first, sub-question there. Do we have complete diversity of citizenship of the parties? The facts say that CopyCo was incorporated in State A. Easy enough. Put a column for that on your scratch paper. Add the president and the main office under State A as well. Then we are told about the bunch of things that were going on in State B. There was the sole manufacturing plant, a distribution center, and most of the employees. So what do you think? Which facts tell us CopyCo's citizenship? Well, the Supreme Court has actually ruled 
that what it calls the nerve center is going to win when it comes to determining citizenship. That means you should look for where the corporation has its brain power versus where it has its manpower. In this situation, state A would win because that's where the top level decisions are being made. So is diversity defeated? Well, here we are told that Sally is a citizen of state B. That's actually more helpful than the word resident, which we saw in the hypo above. That means that Sally is domiciled in state B. So if you conclude that Copy Co. is a citizen of state A, complete diversity is met. If you happen to conclude that Copy Co. is a citizen of state B, remember the important thing is that you explain how you got there. On most exams, even if you get the rule and its application slightly wrong, you can still get partial credit by explaining more in your analysis and at least showing that you're applying the rule in a way that makes sense. If you got it wrong and found that diversity was destroyed, should you quit the analysis there? No, of course not. Just keep going. Next step is the amount in controversy. Sally sued for $100,000, and this is definitely more than $75,000, so easy peasy, this one gets checked off. Both the complete diversity and amount in controversy requirements are met, so the conclusion is the federal court does have subject matter jurisdiction over the case. Remember, as you prepare for your bar exam, it's important that you're well-versed in the laws that tie into subject matter jurisdiction, like aggregation of claims and supplemental jurisdiction. Also, know the precise definitions for things like citizenship and domicile for people and corporations because these topics are also tested on the MBEs. Know what to do with foreign entities or things that could defeat diversity, like joinder of a party. And, of course, as always, be sure to practice writing your way through lots of past bar essays so you can get comfortable applying these rules before exam day. And with that, we're out of time. If you enjoyed this episode of the Bar Exam Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on your favorite listening app. We'd really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Allison at lee at baregzamtoolbox.com or allison at baregzamtoolbox.com. Or you can always contact us via our website contact form at baregzamtoolbox.com. Thanks for listening and we'll talk soon. Mm-hmm.